to our special coverage on the Maasai Mara migration. And our team has been bringing us the exciting stories. Let's now cross over to CCTV's Uche Okoronko, who's live on location. Uche, what's going on there now? Thanks so much, Beatrice. Well, it's been quite a quiet morning here at the Mara River. We've been here for a couple of hours and we've not been able to see that epic crossing quite yet. But if you look just over there, there's a small herd of wildebeest uh, sort of gathering. And if you look up and down the Mara River, you can see a lot of tourist vans sort of preparing themselves to hopefully see a crossing in a couple of hours, In a, in a maybe not, we have no idea uh, at this stage. But of course, this is the reality of what a migration or crossing is. It could take a couple couple of hours, it could take a day, uh, you never know. Nature waits for no man. Nevertheless, it's been quite an interesting day. Earlier on, we were able to uh, drive up uh, here in the wild. Uh, what we saw was that the number of uh, wildlife is increasing across the rolling plains of uh, the Mara. It seems like as the days go by, more and more wildebeest and zebra uh, seem to be uh, crossing over and the number of animals are suddenly multiplying. So it's definitely been quite crowded here in the Maasai Mara. Uche, nature waits for no man and you've mentioned all those tourists. Let's talk tourism, both local and foreign. Right. Well, Beatrice, uh, there are a few things we've noted uh, since we've been here. And of course, uh, we've been talking to the locals, the local ho uh, hotels and the local people around. One thing they said is that the number of tourists this year have uh, increased. The number of occupancy rates in the hotels uh, have in increased. They also mentioned increased. The, they also mentioned the fact that the number of Chinese uh, visiting the Maasai Mara have increased. The number of local Kenyans also coming uh, down to see the migration have increased as opposed to what it was a couple of years uh, before. Now we're driving around and visiting different uh, hotels and it's very interesting to see the unique experiences uh, that they have to offer the tourists visiting the Mara. And here's a look at what we found. We are at the Sarova Hotel, one of the many places that cater to the tourists that come here to the Mara. But this place is a little different. It's surrounded by this lush forest, which is quite unusual in a place that's famous for its rolling plains. And it's certainly a draw for tourists during the migration. In the past week, occupancy has risen to over 80%. And it's booked up for the next three months. The beauty of it also, it coincides with the summer holidays here in Europe. So we have um, a lot of our visitors and their families coming down. But it's not just tourist numbers that have risen. The migration started very early uh, in June. Um, Normally, the last week is when the migration starts. This time, it started early in June. And uh, the numbers this time round, they are way much higher than uh, the numbers we had last year. While hotels like this one usually cater for foreigners, more and more locals have been checking in too. There is a, a new awareness uh, through marketing that um, instead of people only thinking about uh, taking a holiday in Mombasa, and going to Naivasha and Nakuru, the, there's a, a new generation now that is appreciating nature more and that's why the, the numbers are climbing up. These hotels make top dollar during the migration. Here at the Sarova, a luxury tent can set you back a cool $650 a night. But they're surrounded by local communities and we're wondering how they benefit from the influx of rich visitors. When we began some time back, uh, the employment of the local community was only 10%. We've built it through 10%, 20%, Currently, the employment of the local community is uh, 42%. And there you have it. Tourist numbers are on the rise here in the Mara. But hotels say it's not just about making money. It's also about working with the local communities. Ucheo Koronkwa, CCTV, in the Maasai Mara. Well, Lucia, we also understand that CCTV's Sony Methu has been busy as well. What's she been up to? Mm. Well, of course, the local community here, uh, despite the fact that it's sometimes overshadowed by the migration, is a big part of the Mara experience. Nara County, where we are right now, is where the Maasai people uh, are, and they're known for their rich cultural uh, background that has endured uh, for many, many years. Now, Sony Methu actually went out into the community and had a chat with the Maasai about their culture. Take a look. <laughs> Mm. 
Most tourists who visit the Mara will likely hear a song like this one. They're handed down from generation to generation, songs of celebration, which lead to the famous jump. Therefore, they have a jumping competition. Therefore, the Masai Murani, they don't talk to direct to the girls. Uh, they do jumping competition. If you jump high, the more you get more girlfriend as possible and different days. Morans are traditional warriors and they are always dressed unmistakably Maasai. Some of the outfit is purely decorative, but the rest is a survival kit for the wild. The animals are repelled by the color red. It is a traditional Maasai outfit, but also used to scare animals. And if the animal decides to attack, we can take it off, leave it on the ground to confuse the predator. The shoes can last for years. They're made of car tires. The stick to rest on during hours spent herding. And that itch on your back you just can't reach? Well, there's a tool for that too. The traditional sword is usually used for slaughtering. Today, it's a base as I learn to make fire. It's not as easy as it sounds. I'm sure I would have gotten it if I kept on trying. <sighs> I'm told not to worry because usually women don't have to do this. Women are meant to build homes. A frame of branches with ash, soil and cow dung used to fill in the gaps. The mixture keeps away insects and it's quite waterproof. So this is how a standard Maasai Manyata looks like on the inside. On the right, there's some storage area for firewood. On the left, storage area for water. And straight ahead, a small room where they put up a calf so that in the morning they have sufficient milk from the mother. This is just to limit the amount of time the calf can suckle from the mother and ensure that they have milk for themselves in the morning. And straight ahead, this is the main living area. And as you can see, there's a kitchen there and a place to put their utensils. Pretty standard and simple, made of materials they can actually use and find locally, like wood, cow dung, and of course, ash. This is one of the bedrooms. And you'll notice that it's made of soft, olive branches that are intertwined together with wires and there's a cow hide and of course a little bed sheet. Looking at it, it looks uncomfortable actually when you lie on it, it's pretty soft and cozy. Maasai also travel after grazing along with their cattle. In that, they share a trait with the wildebeest of the Great Migration. Sony Methu, CCTV in the Maasai Mara. Well, the herds are actually on the move right now. And as you can see, the tourist vans are heading to that site. We're just about to join them. So thank you so much for joining us. It's goodbye for now from the Mara. Back to you, Beatrice.